for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, The Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests are Peter McLaughlin and author Nancy Krikorian. Peter McLaughlin is the Vice President of Marketing for Qantas Airways. A native of Australia, now living in the Los Angeles area, Peter has a multitude of responsibilities. We wanted to find out exactly what they were, so we cornered him in the Qantas Lounge at the Los Angeles International Airport, and this is what he told us. Hi, Peter. Hi, Joan. How are you doing? Was all your schooling finished in Australia? It was. Yes, it was. My um, high school and um, graduate was all done in Australia. And what did you dream of doing when you were in school? Actually, when I, <coughs> when I was in school, I dreamt of traveling a lot. I really did want to travel. And it's a, it's a natural thing for a lot of Australians when they leave school to travel and go and see the world. And that's what I dreamt of doing. And then how did you fulfill that dream? Well, it turned out that uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper one day for um, Qantas Airways and they were looking for flight attendants. So I saw the ad and I thought, hmm, this could be an interesting way to go and see the world. So I sent off a letter and about three weeks, four weeks later, I found out that I was a flight attendant. Is that right? Mm. You didn't obviously go to school for marketing or public relations or any of that type of thing then? No, well, what I went to school for is I did psychology at uh, university and uh, I looked at a lot of the social psychology and industrial psychology. I specialised in that area. And uh, when I was at um, university, I also did a, a couple of courses in communications. Oh. Okay, so then... While you were, um, while you were flying or before well, did, you started? I did an undergraduate degree while I was flying. Sorry, I did an undergraduate degree before I was flying. Then I went flying because I wanted to travel. And then I did my, <coughs> my, my postgraduate degree uh, while I was flying. Well, did that help you change from uh, <laughs> the flight attendant milieu into a more responsible position? Yes, it did because, you know, it obviously I was able to broaden my uh, education base and uh, while I was flying I saw that there was an opportunity to find out a few little facts and figures about how flying affects the behaviour of flight attendants flying across time zones. So that's in actual fact what I did my master's degree. I, I did my master's on the effects of uh, flying across t time zones on cabin crew performance. And does it affect us? Well, it, it does. <laughs> it, it does. does. I hate to tell you. It? But the interesting thing about it is one of the, the advantages that flight attendants I found have over individual travellers, for argument's sake, is that they, because they're travelling in a group, there is a unity and a camaraderie in that group. And because that they're all, um, um, you know, they get to know each other and they're all going through the same sort of cycles, they can deal with it a lot better than, say, if an individual was travelling. Is it different going from Australia to America or America to uh, the Far East? It, it, does that time zone change? It, or it, it really people? depends on where, you're, where your body clock is originating I from. See. So it depends if you're... Usually when you're coming back home, I have found that the, your performance, and I don't know physiologically what's going on, but your ability to perform certain tasks seems to diminish as you are coming back home. Any home you're Any going home. to. Wherever, I you, see, wherever I home, see, wherever you I may see. call home. Well, once you were so much a part of uh, Qantas, then it must have been easy to get into the marketing part of it. Is that where you went next from, from being a flight attendant? I did. I worked in, initially I worked in uh, an area called product development and, uh -huh. you know, I started to do a number of things in that area. What do you uh, do there? What is well, product development? What you do is you look at the aircraft seats, <laughs> the galleys, the, you know, everything from the decor 
uh, the food, uh, the in-flight amenities for, for both adults and children, and you work out, you know, the directions that you need to, you know, be taking the airline. Uh, and from there, you know, I, I, one of the responsibilities I had was ensuring that, or uh, getting the in-seat videos that we have in both first and business class today is one of the things that that led to. So it's a really broad field. It's a very broad area. You can, you can work with people and try to identify, you know, the seats they sit in, to the curtains, to the, the, the decor, to the, um, the food, to the in-flight entertainment. And marketing is under your purview as well. It, it is now, yes. And what happens with that? <clears throat> well, you, it covers the, the, a broad range of things. I mean, we deal from working with other airlines and alliances and frequent flyer oh, programs. I see. Um, you also, we also deal with um, the advertising, the promotions and the sponsorships that occur. Uh, and you work on just uh, the developing of uh, routes and um, working out where the numbers are going. Okay, I have one more. Public relations is also public under relations. your <laughs> You're right, public <laughs> relations. <laughs> and that uh, entails what? Well, it, didn't, it entails just talking to charming people like you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for and the public. It really is, is trying to expose yourself to the public as much as you can and looking at all the different mediums that you can expose yourself to the public and create awareness of uh, your product. And uh, you know whether or not you do it through uh, media outlets or through you do it through events, uh, yeah. it, it um, really works on a, a quite a large gamut. I mean, public relations can be a number of different things. So do Airlines have uh, diff better advantages over other airlines, say Qantas would have a better advantage flying from LA to Australia than some other airline who flies from LA to Australia. We've definitely got the advantage flying to Australia. <laughs> you I mean, have the one, extension, right? One, we've got the extension throughout Australia, so not only do we get you there, we get you all around Australia, and it's a one-stop shop for an airline. You, you're dealing with the same airline all the way through. Oh, so we, that's very important. Which is extremely important. We can take you anywhere around Australia, you know, and you're always dealing with the same group and you, you haven't got the worry of having your records lost in a myriad of different uh, airline systems, which is always a bit of a worry. So we give you the peace of mind of being able to look after you all the way. And also, I mean, we're Australian. All of us are Australians and nobody knows Australia better than uh, us Australians and we can really <laughs> educate you from the moment you get on the plane out of Los Angeles. And we've been flying simply, we've been flying for 79 years and um, we've been doing a few things right, I think, to keep going for 79 years. And with our latest, you know, the latest product innovations we've had, we make sure that people can get there in the ultimate comfort, whether it is the beds in first class, our new extra spacious room and electronically controlled seat in business class, or at, whether it's in our, our economy class seat that provides the wings and the headrest and the support for ultimate comfort. Are, is there more room in economy class, more room than other airlines? Leg room, maybe seat size, do you, do you look at those things? We look at those things. Uh, the thing about the seat is there's been a lot of um, changes with the seat development over the past few years. Uh, gone are the days where a lot of the seat was taken up by bulky frames mm. with a lot of the uh, and that actually takes up a lot of physical space on the aircraft which in encroaches on your personal space. So what we have done is, is we have spent a lot amount of uh, research and development and identifying seats that offer the ultimate and maximum in comfort but uh, provide a design that is not bulky and cumbersome um, to encroach on your space. So that if anything that gives you two or three more inches. And that's exactly what it does. That, you know. uh, that's really great. Yeah. Now why should we take Qantas to Australia? What's there? What's, in a, what's there? In <laughs> what's there once you get there? Australians. Uh, uh, Australians. <laughs> Very charming, Peter. <laughs> Australia, oh, you have the beaches, you have the outback, you have the wildlife, you have the great restaurants. I mean, you know, the, the beauty of Australia is the, is the wonderful cuisine because of the influences that we've had from our neighbours in Asia and Europe, uh, that they've been able to de develop a lot of a style, a unique style that I think Australia really calls its own in terms of um, uh, the uniqueness. Uh, if so, there's the wine also. The Australian wine is... I believe, can and a you, lot of people say it's the best. <laughs> can, you, can you actually make a traveler feel like they've already started their Australian 
vacation once they get on Qantas and head that way with your food, with your wine, etc. All, all of our food is, is based on, uh, on, on um, Australian cuisine and it's developed by Mr. Neil Perry who is with the Rockpool restaurants in Australia and Neil has done something um, which is really great and it has changed the way that this airline looks at uh, undertaking its uh, meal preparations. His focus, he actually gets on aeroplanes and works with the cabin crew and actually tries to cook it himself and um, goes out and shops and really focuses on the fresh in ingredients and tries to get the best of Australia on our aeroplane in terms of the food. In terms of the Australians, our crew are all Australian, so you're immediately going to get on and, and, and see right. the Australians. So <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to get your first hand tips of where to go and what to do um, from the locals. That's great. And, and, and you know, uh, the Australian wine, as I mentioned earlier, we have, um, you'll be sampling the Australian wines the moment you step, step foot on the aircraft out of leaving LA. So you do get that feeling of Australia. You do get now the feeling of Australia. Now I have to get on Qantas and see what it's like. You do, you do. <laughs> Thanks, Peter, for Thank being you. with us. Thanks, Joan. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with Nancy Krikorian. Nancy Krikorian is a poet, short story writer, and novelist. She lives in New York City with her children and her filmmaker husband, James Seamus. Nancy's been in California for several staged readings from her book, Zabel. The book was published by Grove Atlantic and can be bought in both hard and soft cover. Nancy, how did you find the LA audiences compared to the New York audiences? Well, the funny thing is that most of the readings that I do, it's a, an audience of Armenians. I mean, there are always a few non-Armenians, but Armenians in, I've read in Frankfurt, Germany, and in um, Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, and in Boston, and in Philadelphia, and LA, and New York, and <laughs> Armenians are pretty much the same wherever you go, honestly. <laughs> I look out and I think, wow, that looks like my uncle. But that's <laughs> very interesting because all, all the, um, of course, the book is about Armenians. Right. You're Armenian, right. and I'm Armenian. But the other thing is, I, I know you live in um, New York. When you come to visit in LA, do you find the pace different, or have you been able to stay here long enough to see the differences? Um, well, the thing is, where, we, um, where I live in New York, I live way up in Morningside Heights near Columbia, camp, Columbia University campus, and as a friend of mine who lives downtown says, that's practically Westchester, <laughs> i.e. the suburbs. So it's not quite, the pace isn't quite as intense, but I feel the difference when I come out to L.A. Everything just is spread out more, so the energy sort of isn't quite so bunched up the way it is in New York. But it seems like that doesn't really have a, an effect on your audience, does it? Because the Armenian no, audience Armenians is the same. are Armenians. <laughs> All the work that I know uh, that you've done, of course, has an ethnic quality. Have mm -hmm. you written anything without that ethnic background? Uh, I've written a lot of poems that are sort of just generically American poems, I would, I would think. But uh, I have a, a manuscript of poems that I'm working on right now that's about a third Armenian-themed and a third just about my childhood and a third that's um, sort of love poems that have nothing to do with being Armenian. Are you going to publish them all together? Well, w the idea would be when I, I'm working on a novel at the same time and I try to get it when I, um, when the agent sells the novel, we hope she sells the poetry <laughs> with it because, you know, po publishing poetry is a charity. <laughs> you know, um, well, that's true because <laughs> poets are, uh, actually poets are beginning to be, uh, come into their own. It's really a push for poetry now. Yes. I was in. I interviewed Aram Saroyan, and his poetry. He read his poetry um, on the show, and he's done a lot of poetry readings. And people are interested in it, especially if it's easy to grasp. I know published pieces of yours, My Armenia, Red Armenian Red Slippers, uh, Syria. But would Syria be about an Armenian? So all background? those three. Those three pieces are were about you know, are on Armenian themes, those three particular ones. But I, you know, I've published other ones in other magazines that are, you know, you wouldn't read it and think this was written by an Armenian unless you look at the name. But um, 
Did, did Syria have anything to do with you? Were you born there? No, what it is is Syria is one part of a three-part poem that's called Armenia, and it's, um, um. it's Syria, um, Cyprus, and Egypt, Cairo, or so it's Syria, Cyprus, and Egypt. I see. The three different parts. And you wrote on yeah. e each, each one of those? How long did it take you to write Zabel? Uh, I had a small business that I was running, and I had two ch I gave birth to two children <laughs> in the meantime, so it was over the course of six years. It was a long process. Did you write it in Armenian? <laughs> no, I'm an Armenian American writer. I I'm studying Armenian now, and I'm I'm making it's it's very fun. I'm writing little stories and poems in Armenian. You are really. Fa this you is know, a joke very, because you know, no, I've no, but it's true. First grade <laughs> level, and then I take it to my Armenian tutor, and she corrects the grammar and everything. But she says you already have a style, <laughs> so that's <laughs> nice. It's very difficult yeah, to yeah. read and to write and also to speak. Yeah. Well, and I know I was born here. Were you born in yes. America? Yeah. So I was born here, and of course you lose all of that, or you never really even get it unless your grandparents were there. So how did you start Zabel? Is it a real person? Um, uh, I started working on the novel sometime after my grandmother died, and I had the idea of writing a um, about some of the stories that she had told me about her experience, you know, about her life. And I invented a, a character, you know, Zabel is not my grandmother, but she, some of the st Zabel stories are my grandmother's stories. It's kind of a composite character that I made by taking various pieces and aspects of different women's lives and personalities, you know, Armenian women in my church that I knew. Were so you interviewing people to get I interviewed to find my out? grandmother before she died, and then I went, after she died, I went and talked to her friend Alice Caribbean, who was the model for the Arsene character in the book. Oh, I see. So you actually had faces in your mind while you were right. Um, yeah, <laughs> Zabel wasn't quite my grandmother, but I, I have to say the Arsene character was very much this Ar Alice Caribbean, who was a friend of my grandmother's, who was a, a, uh, an, an amazing, funny, spicy character. And the thing with the, an ethnic book, I mean, it could be appreciated by everyone. I mean, we always hear things about the Holocaust, and we read things about the Jewish uh, immigration, right. and I think there's such a similarity. Well, uh, that was, what was interesting was that the, the editor, my editor at Grove Atlantic, the paperback is actually out from Bard, Avon, but, oh. the, but the hardcover, when it came out last year, um, from Grove Atlantic, the editor had said that it reminded her of things like Christina Garcia, Streaming in Cuban, Same which thing. is a Cuban-American book, right. or um, Julia Alvarez, or comparison, uh, one of the reviews compared it to Amy Tan, and things like that. There's this whole new sort of genre of ethnic American women's fiction. And also this the immigration story. The it's immigration. a quintessentially American story, right? All it Everybody's is. from someplace. You know, that's very true. So it really is more American. I mean, it is Mer American, but you have, it crosses the board of people coming to America from everywhere. Right. And we, all, we always think of the, the Jewish immigrants, we forget, and the Mexican immigrants, but you have the Spanish and the Asian, that whole influx of Asians. And Asian. your way of looking is all very West Coast because on the East That's Coast, right. you know, you had the, the Irish and the Italians and... and yeah, we don't look at that. Right, you know. That's true. I'm, I'm from the East Coast, so those are the other groups that I think of. And um, people who read my book, non-Armenians who read the book said, oh, this reminded me of my Ukrainian grandmother, or this reminded me of my Irish grandmother, or, you know, so there was something about that generation of women, you know, the f first generation to come to this country that I think the book also speaks to that. Just Why didn't you just write your grandmother's story? Why did you novelize, or novelize it, make yeah. it into a novel? <laughs> Fictionalize it? Fictionalize um, it. <laughs> because um, I think partly it had to do with being a poet, and it also had to do with I wanted there are certain there are liberties that you can take and things that you can invent, mm -hmm. details that you can imagine. If you f if if I felt freed from the actual story to use it just as a sp her actual life story as a springboard to imagine another character in another life. So you just kept you could you could use everything. Right. Well, the, there's a in the book there. Zabel has a when she's a child and their family is driven out into the desert. She has a tin cup on a string and. My mother, my grandmother, as far as I know, didn't have that. I just, but I just, these images would come to me, and I would incorporate them, and I felt freer, you know, working in fiction to bring things in like that. Do you think there's a film here? 
Oh, I honestly, no, I don't. My husband's a producer and a screenwriter, and who, a man who speaks in written prose, and he said that he was proud of the book because it was a good book, number one, and number two, because here comes the written prose. It resists the logic of late capitalist film production. Oh, bravo. <laughs> by, <laughs> by, bravo. <laughs> by which he means that because it's period and it ranges from 1915 to 1985, and it goes from... Um, from you know the hinterlands, uh, a, a village in um, Silesia, and goes out to the Syrian desert and to Istanbul, and then to America. You know it would just be phenomenally expensive to produce. Oh, so he's looking at it from a practical point, a of production angle. I'm looking at it as a wonderful story that could be told because I mean we right, have but, only but, you Spielberg know, telling <laughs> you know his story. We don't have anyone telling the Armenian immigration story. Right. Well, I think that there, you know, maybe, the, you know, a friend of mine, filmmaker Adam Agoyan, maybe he'll, you know, not my book, but there are other Armenian stories, you know, that could be told. Yeah. He, if anyone could do <laughs> it, right. he could do it. I saw a very short uh, piece that he did. For, for his the, son, Arshil, right. For yep. the Venice Biennale. It was included. It, it was a video. I think it was about eight minutes. And it was his son, Arshil, and the comparison to Arshil Gorky and the comparison to... Um, what was going on in Yerevan, Armenia, when they came here. It was really potent. It was strong and really great. And I wonder how much of that you could take for a, a whole feature film. Right. Well, he, I don't know if you saw some calendar, which is the one that he shot part in Armenia. And then that was also very beautiful. No, I didn't see that. Um, but I think he's a great filmmaker. Will you read us a little bit? Sure. Uh, I'd love to. I'll read it. Set it up for us. Right. Um, I'm going to read the. The thing that I tried to do in the book was make it almost like a fable, and I wanted to also have um, the sadness, the tragedy of the Armenian Genocide, but also the, the humor and resiliency of the, this character. And so there's a lot of funny stuff in the book, but the part that I'm going to read from is in the first chapter of the book where Isabel describes her experience in 1915 when her family is driven from the village that they live in, in uh, Silesia in the Ottoman Empire, out of their you know, out of their home, through the mountains, through the desert, out into the Syrian desert. And um, I tried to write, I wrote this part from the point of view of a small child who doesn't really understand what's uh, happening, right. but who just sees what's passing before her eyes. So um, this is after her grandfather and her grandmother have died, and she's with her mother and her baby brother, and they're um, out in the desert. There were bodies everywhere I looked. Some were old, some were babies, some were bleeding from the mouth, some were half alive. The smell was terrible, the flies, the maggots, the animals chewing on an arm or a leg while the eyes rolled up, staring at the sky. But we kept walking. Where are we going? I asked my mother. She didn't know, but we kept walking. My mother sold the pots, the bowls, the spoons, the knife, even her headscarf for food. All we had left was a tin cup on a frayed string around my neck. We came to a place in the desert where we were told to stay. My brother, Krikor, died there. At <clears> night, <throat> under the light of the moon, my mother dug a pit using my cup. She couldn't dig very deep, but she wanted to hide his body from the birds that followed us. She wrapped him in her shawl and put the bundle in the hole. We closed up the place with sand, and then we said a prayer for his soul. The soul of our baby was as small as a breath. It joined the other dead souls in the night wind and blew across the desert sands. This was to be our home, a stretch of desert, with a large cloth she had taken from a dead woman by the road and some sticks she found, my mother made us a tent. There was just enough room for us to sit up or to lie down side by side on a piece of blanket with our feet sticking out. I heard someone say, the name of this place is Ras Alain. We lived there for a while, with barely anything to eat and water I brought in my tin cup while my mother's eyes grew bigger in her head. She began to look like someone I didn't know. And uh, right after that, her mother dies and then Zabel's life is more or less saved, saved by uh, her meeting up with a, a friend of hers, uh, Arsine, who helps her through the rest of, you know, that experience of near starvation in the desert. It's so, you know, and you really listen to what you're saying, a person can't talk after that. It, it just kind of takes everything away. And that's why when you're reading it, when I read it, I, I think I just sat down and read it all in one night because you have to get through it. 
you just have to get to the end and you have to hear the little bits of comedy that you bring into it to cut that heaviness. And it was a very heavy story. Yeah, well it's, it is. But at the same time, as I said, I wanted to pay tribute to the resiliency and the humor. My grandmother is a very funny person. And even when I went and talked to her friend Alice Caribbean about the experience um, during the deportations, she said, she was very funny, she would say to me, oh, your grandmother, <laughs> she was so wishy-washy. <laughs> if it wasn't for me, she would have been dead in the desert. I had to be Jadbig for the two of us. And Jadbig is this Armenian word that means just sort of tough. tough. You know, strong. I know, it's amazing how they, how they can talk about it like that. I don't know how they ever came here and made a life the way they made it. So it was great. Um, you won the 1998 Anahid Literary Award. Is that what it's called? Yeah, that Columbia is. Columbia University. University. Right. And I know there's a small monetary stipend to it, but it, there's also this other kind of thing where I think you're, you're leading you're like a writer who can help other people. Is there like an intern, not an intern, but inspirational thing about it? Well, for me, the, the part of what an honor it was is the other people who've won the award in the past. You know, it's a very nice list of people. Adam Ogoyan won the award. Leslie Evasion, who's the playwright who wrote Nine Armenians, won it. Eric Bogosian, right. who's the actor and, uh, the, and <coughs> performance artist and writer. So I feel, it, I feel very honored to be in that company. What is the responsibility? Is there a responsibility? No, 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 no there's no, no responsibility. No, responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're just, you know, they just, I think that they say in the letter that they send you that the award is given to encourage, our, you know, writers of Armenian descent in, in their careers. And so would this help with your next project? Something like that, would that? spur you on to start another project or what well I'm already on? I'm already you know a third of the way into my new novel so oh, and, and, and what is it well right now it's called Annie Silver and it's about a girl growing up in Watertown in this in the 60s and 70s um, and she's half Armenian and half Jewish and and Watertown is in Boston oh Watertown is a suburb of Boston where I grew up which has a very large Armenian community since the 1920s there were when I was growing up, four Armenian churches, three Armenian bakeries, two Armenian cultural centers, and about a third of the town's population is Armenian. And they have a wonderful Armenian Library and Museum of America. That's right. Which is, uh, I'm on the board, and I love going back for that. I'm so glad that you were in Los Angeles in time to do the show today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. And I know um, your work is translated in countries all over the world, so it must have a it must have something that's catching all the Europeans and, and a worldwide appeal. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm really glad that you were here. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot, John. Now, don't go away. We want you to come back next week. <laughs> And uh, keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. Well, that was easy, Joan. You're it fun to easy. talk to. Yeah. I talk too much. Yeah.